Beauty and the Factory by G.K. Chesterton. The age of reason allowed itself touches of sentiment. In Porcelain Shepherdesses and the Picture of Garus, the age of suggestion does not allow itself any touch of reason, and it has no light touch about anything. What would either Johnson or Voltaire or Rousseau have thought if they turned from a porcelain shepherdess and seen a huge hoarding covered with a pink face larger than a pantomime ogre's and inscribed, Keep that schoolgirl complexion. They would have felt as if a new vice had been invented, and perhaps, in a sense, the world has waited till now for science or vulgarity. These reflections have been stirred within me by turning over the pages of an illustrated magazine and finding a typical article called Beauty in the Factory. It is not concerned with maintaining that factories are beautiful, or even that they could be beautiful. The ground of the writer's gratification seems to be entirely in the fact that there are quite a number of pretty girls in factories, which is doubtless the case, as there are a great many pretty girls in institutions, reformatories, penal settlements, slums, and the like, but the subject seems scarcely worthy of elaborate treatment by a serious scientific inspector and professional man. When we come to the article itself, we note another of the fatuous fashions of the day. I mean the grotesque use of illustrations, which do not illustrate. Perhaps the most amusing is a reproduction of Burne Jones's Golden Stairs, accompanied by a photograph of a number of young women in overalls coming downstairs in the chocolate factory at Bourneville. It will not strike everybody as a blinding revelation of the beauty that dwells in factories to be told that Bourneville employees occasionally come downstairs, instead of being lowered by ropes and pulleys, or that they walk down on their feet and not on their hands. That is the only resemblance I can perceive between their movement and that of the pre-Raphaelite maidens, but the caption under the picture calls it a fascinating comparison. If it were really considered, it would be a rather deadly comparison. The first thing that would occur to me, as a criticism, would be that while the Burne Jones ladies have similar clothes, they have not got the same clothes. There is present that slight variation which is everywhere the movement of freedom and the main condition of beauty, but the factory girls are in a uniform, and though they, there may be individual beauty, there is not individual freedom. One does not need to be specially devoted to the Burne Jones idea to feel that the melancholy of Burne Jones is more cheerful than the cheerfulness of Bourneville. But the case is the same with standards of beauty that none will call melancholy in that medieval manner. For instance, the type of the Venus of Milo does exist, though it is certainly not a Venus but a victory, or some graver goddess, with the br broad brooding brows and the strong stoop of the neck, almost like a bull lowering its horn. I dare say the types does exist in factories, though the Venus of Milo would not command high wages where employers are not looking for hands. And if the goddess of the little million farm ever found her own hands, the employer might with wisdom take his own heels. But anyhow, underneath the Greek head is reproduced a photograph of a very bright, attractive little modern lady who is about as like the Greek statue as she is like the hippopotamus at the zoo. God knows what it all means, but that is the sort of thing it says. It is worth adding that the bright lady has to be taken with a bright smile. The man who could imagine that the Venus of Milo, with a bright smile, deserves to be bitten to death by advertisements of toothpaste. These people never think of learning anything from the works of the past, or they might learn from the world would be a brighter place if some of the modern goddesses can learn not to smile. And what would be beauty without dreams? And so, to that end, I present to you a very early article by G.K. Chesterton, published in 1901, called simply, Dreams. There can be comparatively little question that the place ordinarily occupied by dreams in literature is peculiarly unreal and unsatisfying. When the hero tells us that last night he dreamed a dream, we are quite certain from the perfect and decorative character of the dream that he made it up at breakfast. The dream is so reasonable that it is quite impossible. An angel came to him and opened before him a scroll inscribed with some tremendous moral truth. A knight in armor rode past him declaring some ideal quest. The phantom of his mother arose to warn him from some imminent sin. Dreams like these are, with occasional exceptions, practically unknown in the lawless kingdoms of the night. A dream is scarcely ever rounded to express faultlessly some faultless ideas. An angel might indeed open a scroll before the dreamer, but it would probably be inscribed with some remark about excursion trains to Brighton. A knight in armor might ride by him, but it would be impossible to deny that the most salient fact about the warrior was the fact that he was wearing three hats. His mother might indeed appear to the dreamer and give him the tenderest and most elevated counsel, 
but it would be impossible for the loftiest ethical comfort to entirely obscure the fact that her nose was growing longer and longer every minute. Dreams have a kind of hellish ingenuity, an energy in the pursuit of the inappropriate. The most omniscient and cunning artist never took so much trouble, or achieved such success in finding exactly the word that was right, or exactly the action that was significant, as this midnight lord of misrule can do in finding exactly the word that is wrong and exactly the action that is meaningless. The object of art is to subordinate the detail that is incidental to the tendency which is general. The object of a dream appears to be so to develop itself that some utterly futile and half-witted detail shall gradually devour all the other details of the vision. The flower upon the wallpaper just behind the head of Napoleon Bonaparte becomes brighter and brighter until we see nothing but a flower. The third waistcoat button of our best friend grows larger and larger until it is the great round sun of a revolving cosmos. Thus, at first sight, it would seem that the Lord of Dreams was the eternal opponent of art. He seems to be the, uh, to the ascetic system what Satan is to the religious system, an unconquerable enemy, an irreducible minimum. The prigs of art who in this period erect their Im impeccable edifice with even more than the gravity of the prigs of religion have to deal with this mighty underworld of man in which their new rules are set as much as not as the old ones, which is as careless of the modern canons of pleasure as of the ancient canons of pain. Asleep the artist is in the hands of an enchantress of ugliness who makes him love the discordant and hate the beautiful. In that realm, the landscape painter paints monstrous landscapes, mingling scarlet and purple. In that realm, the musician devises torturing melodies in the Arctic archetype top-heavy cathedrals. So far as the forms and modes of art are concerned, this is indeed true, that translucently allegorical dreams are so often narrated in romance are essentially inconceivable. When the aged priest in a story narrates his dream in which the imagery is dignified and the message plain, we are free to yield finally to a conviction that must have long been growing on us and conclude that he is a somewhat distinguished liar. Dreams may have infinite meanings, but those meanings are not conveyed, obviously, by communicative mothers and candid angels. The Bible is an excellent place to look for wisdom and morality older than mere words and ideals, and there's certainly far more truth in the old biblical version of the nature of dreams, which made them inscrutable and somewhat grotesque parables requiring particular persons to interpret them. If great spiritual truths are conveyed by dreams, they must certainly be conveyed as they were to Pharaoh or Nebuchadnezzar, by farcical mysteries of clay-footed images and lean cows eating fat ones. But there is another and far deeper manner in which dreams definitely correspond to art. Nothing is more remarkable in some of the great artistic masterpieces of the world than their startling deficiency in much of that sense of grace and proportion which goes nowadays by the name of art. If art were really what some contemporary critics represented, a matter of faultless arrangement of harmonies and transitions, Shakespeare would certainly not be anything like so great an artist as the last poetaster in Fleet Street who published a series of seven sonnets on seven varieties of grey sunset. Shakespeare often suffers from too much inventiveness. That which clogs us in his masterpieces is not so much inferior work as irrelevant brilliancy, not so much failures as fragments of other masterpieces. Dickens was designless without knowing or caring. Stern was designless by design. Yet these great works, which make up, mix up abstractions, fit for an epic with fooleries not fit for pantomime, which clash the sword with the red-hot poker, which present such a picture of a literary, literary chaos as might be produced of the characters in every book from Paradise Lost to Pickwick, broke from their covers and mingled in one mad romance. These great works have assuredly a unity of their own, or they would not be works of art. The unity of which they have is a unity which, when properly understood, gives us the key of almost the whole of literary aesthetics. It is the same unity that we find in dreams. There is one unity which we do find in dreams. It binds together the, uh, their brutal inconsequence and all their moonstruck anticlimaxes. It makes the unimaginable nocturnal farce which begins with a saint choosing parasols and ends with a policeman shelling peas as rounded and single a harmony as some poets roundel upon a passion flower. This unity is the absolute unity of emotion. If we wish to experience a pure and naked feeling, we can never experience it so really as in that unreal land. There the passions seem to live and outlawed an abstract existence, unconnected with any facts or persons. In dreams we have revenge without any injury, remorse without any sin, memory without any recollections, hope without any prospect. Love, indeed, 
almost proves itself a divine thing, by the logic of dreams. For in a dream, every material circumstance may alter. Spectacles may grow on a baby, and mustaches on a maiden aunt. And yet the great sway of one tyrannical tenderness may never cease. Our dream may begin with the end of the world, and end with a picnic at Hampton Court. But the same rich and nameless mood will be expressed by f the falling stars and by the crumbling sandwiches. In a dream, daisies may glare at us like the eyes of demons. In a dream, lightning and conflagration may warn and soothe us like our own fireside. In this subconscious world, in short, existence betrays itself. It shows that it is full of spiritual forces which disguise themselves as lions and lampposts, which can as easily disguise themselves as butterflies and Babylonian temples. The essential unity of a dream, which is never broken or impaired, is the unity of its attitude towards God, wistful or vacant, or grateful or rebellious or assured. Surely this unity of dreams was the unity which underlay the old wild masterpieces of literature. The plays of Shakespeare, for example, may be full of incidental discords, but none of them ever fails to convey its aboriginal sentiment, that life is as black as the tempest or as green as the greenwood. It is said that art should represent life. So indeed it should, but it labors under the primary disadvantage, that no man has seen life at any time. Long records at Whitechapel and crime, long rows of Brixton villas, the words which one clerk says to another clerk, the dispatches that one diplomatist writes to another diplomatist. None of these things even approach to being life. For, the, for life, the man of science, even if he lives in the very heart of Brixton, is still searching with a microscope. Life dwells alone in our very heart of hearts. Life is one and virgin and unconquered, and sometimes in the watches of the night speaks in its own terrible harmony.